Chapter 134 On the Anvil The ashram had been in existence only a few months when we were put to a test such as I had. Scarcely expected. I received a letter from Umratlal Thakur to this effect, a humble and honest. Untouchable family is desirous of joining your ashram. Will you accept them? I was perturbed. I had never expected that an untouchable family with an introduction from no. Less a man than Thakur Bapa would so soon be seeking admission to the ashram. I shared the letter with my companions. They welcomed it. I wrote to Umratlal Thakur expressing our willingness to accept the family, provided all the members were ready to abide by the rules of the ashram. The family consisted of Dadabai, his wife Danaben and their daughter Lakshmi, then Amir. Toddling babe. Dudabai had been a teacher in Bombay. They all argued to abide by the rules. And were accepted. But their admission created a flutter amongst the friends who had been helping the ashram. The very first difficulty was found with regard to the use of the well, which was partly controlled by the owner of the bungalows. The man in charge of the water lift objected that drops of water from our bucket would pollute him. So he took to swearing at us and molesting Dudabai. I told everyone to put up with the abuse and continue drawing water at any cost. When he saw that we did not return his abuse, the man became ashamed and ceased to bother us. All monetary help, however, was stopped. The friend who had asked that question about an untouchable being able to follow the rules of the ashram had never expected that any such would be forthcoming. With the stopping of monetary help came rumors of proposed social boycott. We were prepared for all this. I had told my companions that if we were boycotted and denied the usual faculties, we would not leave Ahmedabad. We would rather go and stay in the untouchables quarter and live on whatever we could get by manual labor. Matters came to such a pass that Maganlal Gandhi one day gave me this notice, we are out of funds and there is nothing for the next month. I quietly replied, then we shall go to the untouchables quarter. This was not the first time I had been faced with such a trial. On all such occasions God has sent help at the last moment. One morning, shortly after Maganlal had given me warning of our monetary plight, one of the children came and said that a chef who was waiting in a car outside wanted to see me. I went out to him. I want to give the ashram some help, said I, and I confess. I am at the present moment at the end of my resources. I shall come tomorrow at this time, he said. Will you be here? Yes, said I, and he left. Next day, exactly at the appointed hour, the car drew up near our quarters, and the horn was blown. The children came with the news. The chef did not come in. I went out to see him. He placed in my hands currency notes of the value of 13,000 rupees and drove away. I had never expected this help, and what a novel way of rendering it. The gentleman had never before visited the ashram. So far as I can remember, I had met him only once. No visit, no. Inquiries, simply rendering help and going away. This was a unique experience for me. The help deferred the exodus to the untouchables quarter. We now felt quite safe for a year. Just as there was a storm outside, so was there a storm in the ashram itself. Though in South Africa, untouchable friends used to come to my place and live and feed with me, my wife and other women did not seem quite to relish the admission into the ashram of the untouchable. Friends. My eyes and ears easily detected their indifference, if not their dislike, towards Danaben. The monetary difficulty had caused me no anxiety, but this internal storm was more than I could. Bear. Danaben was an ordinary woman. Dudabai was a man with slight education but of good. Understanding. I liked his patience. Sometimes he did flare up, but on the whole I was well impressed with his forbearance. I pleaded with him to swallow minor insults. He not only agreed, but prevailed upon his wife to do likewise. The admission of this family proved a valuable lesson to the ashram. In the very beginning we 
proclaimed to the world that the ashram would not countenance untouchability. Those who wanted to help the ashram were thus put on their guard and the work of the ashram in this direction was considerably simplified. The fact that it is mostly the real orthodox Hindus who have met the daily growing expenses of the ashram is perhaps a clear indication that untouchability is shaken to its foundation. There are indeed many other proofs of this, but the fact that good Hindus do not scruple to help an ashram where we go the length of dining with the untouchables is no small proof. I am sorry that I should have to skip over quite a number of things pertaining to this subject, how we tackled delicate questions arising out of the main question how we had to overcome some unexpected difficulties and various other matters which are quite relevant to a description of experiments with truth. The chapters that follow will also suffer from the same drawback. I shall have to omit important details because most of the characters in the drama are still alive and it is not proper without permission to use their names in connection with events with which they are concerned. It is hardly practicable to obtain their consent or to get them every now and then to revise the chapters concerning themselves. Besides such procedure is outside the limit of this autobiography. I therefore fear that the rest of the story, valuable as it in my opinion to seekers, after truth, will be told with inevitable omissions. Nevertheless, it is my desire and hope, God, willing to bring this narrative down to the days of non coop Chapter 135. Abolition of Indentured Emigration. We shall, for a moment, take leave of the ashram, which in the very beginning had to weather internal and external storms, and briefly advert to a matter that engaged my attention. Indentured laborers were those who had emigrated from India to labor under an indenture for five years or less. Under the Smutskandi settlement of 1914, the three-pound tax in respect of the indentured emigrants to natal had been abolished, but the general emigration from India still needed treatment. In March 1916 Pundit Madan Mohan Malavyaji moved a resolution in the Imperial Legislative Council for the abolition of the indenture system. In accepting the motion Lord Hardinge announced that he had obtained from His Majesty's government the promise of the abolition in due course of the system. I felt however that India could not be satisfied with so very vague assurance but ought to agitate for immediate abolition. India had tolerated the system through her sheer negligence and I believed the time had come when people could successfully agitate for this redress. I met some of the leaders, wrote in the press, and saw that public opinion was solidly in favor of immediate abolition. Might this be a fit subject for Satyagraha? I had no doubt that it was, but I did not know the modus operandi. In the meantime the Viceroy had made no secret of the meaning of the eventual abolition which, as he said, was abolition within such reasonable time as will allow of alternative arrangements. Introduced. So in February 1917, Pundit Malavyaji asked for leave to introduce a bill for the immediate abolition of the system. Lord Chelmsford refused permission. It was time for me to tour the country for an all-India agitation. Before I started the agitation I thought it proper to wait upon the Viceroy. So I applied for an interview. He immediately granted it. Mr. Maffey, now Sir John Maffey, was his private secretary. I came in close contact with him. I had a satisfactory talk with Lord Chelmsford who, without being definite, promised to be a helpful. I began my tour from Bombay. Mr. Jangir Pati undertook to convene the meeting under the auspices of the Imperial Citizenship Association. The Executive Committee of the Association met first for framing the resolutions to be moved at the meeting. Dr. Stanley Reed, SJT, now Sir. Lalabai Samaldas, SJT, Natrajan, and Mr. Pati were present at the committee meeting. The Discussion centered round the fixing of the period within which the government was to be asked to abolish the system. There were three proposals, viz. for abolition as soon as possible, abolition 
by the July 31st and immediate abolition. I was for a definite date as we could then decide. What to do if the government failed to accede to our request within the time limit? SJT Lalabai was for immediate abolition. He said immediate indicated a shorter period than the July 31st. I explained that the people would not understand the word immediate. If we wanted to get them to do something, they must have a more definite word. Everyone would interpret immediate in his own way, government one way, the people another way. There was no question of misunderstanding the 31st of July, and if nothing was done by that date, we could proceed. Further, Dr. Reed saw the force of the argument and ultimately SJT Lalabai also agreed. We adopted the July 31st as the latest date by which the abolition should be announced, a resolution. To that effect was passed at the public meeting and meetings throughout India resolved. Accordingly, Mrs. Jaijipati put all her energies into the organization of a ladies deputation to the Viceroy. Amongst the ladies from Bombay who formed the deputation, I remember the names of Lady Tata and the late Dilshat began. The deputation had a great effect. The Viceroy gave an encouraging reply. I visited Karachi, Calcutta and various other places. There were fine meetings everywhere and there was unbounded enthusiasm. I had not expected anything like it when the agitation was launched. In those days I used to travel alone and had therefore wonderful experiences. See, ID men were always after me. But as I had nothing to conceal, they did not molest me nor did I cause them any trouble. Fortunately I had not then received the stamp of Mahatmaship though the shout of. That name was quite common where people knew me. On one occasion the detectives disturbed me at several stations asked for my ticket and took down the number. I of course readily replied to all questions they asked. My fellow passengers had taken me to be a sadhu or a fakir. When they saw that I was being molested at every station they were exasperated and swore at the detectives. Why are you worrying the poor? Sadhu for nothing, they protested. Don't you show these scoundrels your ticket, they said. Addressing me, I said to them gently, it is no trouble to show them my ticket. They are doing their duty. The passengers were not satisfied, they evinced more and more sympathy and strongly objected to this sort of ill treatment of innocent men. But the detectives were nothing. The real hardship was the third class traveling. My bitterest experience was from Lahore to Delhi. I was going to Calcutta from Karachi via Lahore where I had to change trains. It was full and those who could get in did so by sheer force, often sneaking through windows if the doors were locked. I had to reach Calcutta on the date fixed for the meeting and if I missed this train I could not arrive in time. I had almost given up hope of getting in. No one was willing to accept me when Porter discovering my plight came to me and said, Give me twelve annas and I'll get you a seat. Yes, said I, you shall have twelve annas if you do. Procure me a seat. The young man went from carriage to carriage entreating passengers but no. One heeded him. As the train was about to start, some passengers said, there is no room here. But you can shove him in if you like. He will have to stand. Well, asked the young porter. I readily agreed and he shoved me in bodily through the window. Thus I got in and the porter earned his twelve annas. The night was a trial. The other passengers were sitting somehow. I stood two hours holding the chain of the upper bunk. Meanwhile some of the passengers kept worrying me incessantly. Why? Will you not sit down? They asked. I tried to reason with them saying there was no room but they could not tolerate my standing though they were lying full length on the upper bunks. They did not tire of worrying me neither did I tire of gently replying to them. This at last mollified them. Some of them asked me my name and made room for me. Patience was thus rewarded. I was dead tired and my head was reeling. God sent help just when it was most needed. 
In that way I somehow reached Delhi and thence Calcutta. The Maharaja of Kasimbazar, the President of the Calcutta meeting was my host. Just as in Karachi, here also there was Unbounded enthusiasm. The meeting was attended by several Englishmen. Before the July 31st the government announced that indentured emigration from India was Stopped. It was in 1894 that I drafted the first petition protesting against the system and I had then hoped that this semi-slavery, as Sir W. W. Hunter used to call the system, would someday be brought to an end. There were many who aided in the agitation which was started in 1894, but I cannot help saying that potential satyagraha hastened the end. For further details of that agitation and of those who took part in it, I refer the reader to my Satyagraha in South Africa. Chapter 136. The Stain of Indigo. Champaran is the land of King Janaka. Just as it abounds in mango groves, so used it to be full of indigo plantations until the year 1917. The Champaran tenant was bound by law to plant three out of every 20 parts of his land with indigo for his landlord. This system was known as the Hashtag Tinkathis hashtag system as three hashtag cat as hashtag out of 20, which make one acre, had to be planted with indigo. I must confess that I did not then know even the name, much less the geographical position of Champaran, and I had hardly any notion of indigo plantations. I had seen packets of indigo, but little dreamed that it was grown and manufactured in Champaran at great hardship to thousands of agriculturists. Rajkumar Shukla was one of the agriculturists who had been under this harrow, and he was filled with a passion to wash away the stain of indigo for the thousands who were suffering as he had suffered. This man caught hold of me at Lucknow, where I had gone for the Congress of 1918. Vakil Babu will tell you everything about our distress, he said, and urged me to go to Champaran. Vakil Babu was none other than Babu Brachkishore Prasad, who became my esteemed co-worker in Champaran, and who is the soul of public work in Bihar. Rajkumar Shukla brought him to my tent. He was dressed in a black alpaca hashtag Achkan hashtag and trousers. Brachkishore Babu failed then to make an impression on me. I took it that he must be some vakil exploiting the simple agriculturists. Having heard from him something of Champaran, I replied as was my wont. I can give no opinion. Without seeing the condition with my own eyes, you will please move the resolution in the Congress, but leave me free for the present. Rajkumar Shukla of course wanted some help from the Congress. Babu Brachkishore Prasad moved the resolution, expressing sympathy for the people of Champaran, and it was unanimously passed. Rajkumar Shukla was glad, but far from satisfied. He wanted me personally to visit Champaran and witness the miseries of the riots there. I told him that I would include Champaran in the tour, which I had contemplated and give it a day or two. One day will be enough, said he, and you will see things with your own eyes. From Lucknow I went to Kampur Rajkumar Shukla followed me there. Champaran is very near. Here. Please give a day, he insisted. Pray excuse me this time, but I promise that I will come. Said I further committing myself. I returned to the ashram. The ubiquitous Rajkumar was there too. Pray fix the day now, he said. Well, said I, I have to be in Calcutta on such and such a date, come and meet me then, and take me from there. I did not know where I was to go, what to do, what things to see. Before I reached Bupen Babu's place in Calcutta, Rajkumar Shukla had gone and established himself there. Thus this ignorant, unsophisticated but resolute agriculturist captured me. So early in 1917, we left Calcutta for Champaran, looking just like fellow rustics. I did not even know the train. He took me to it and we traveled together, reaching Putna in the morning. This was my first visit to Putna. I had no friend or acquaintance with whom I could think of putting up. I had an idea that Rajkumar Shukla, simple agriculturist as he was, must have some influence in Putna. I had come to know him a little more on the journey, and on reaching Putna I had no 
illusions left concerning him. He was perfectly innocent of everything. The vakils that he had, taken to be his friends were really nothing of the sort. Poor Rajkumar was more or less as a menial to them. Between such agriculturist clients and their vakils there is a gulf as wide as the Ganges in flood. Rajkumar Shukla took me to Rajendra Babu's place in Patna. Rajendra Babu had gone to Puri or some other place, I now forget which. There were one or two servants at the bungalow who paid us no attention. I had with me something to eat. I wanted dates which my companion procured for me from the bazaar. There was strict untouchability in Bihar. I might not draw water at the well whilst the servants were using it, less drops of water from my bucket might pollute them, the servants not knowing to what caste I belonged. Rajkumar directed me to the indoor latrine, the servant promptly directed me to the outdoor one. All this was far from surprising or irritating to me, for I was inured to such things. The servants were doing the duty which they thought Rajendra Babu would wish them to do. These entertaining experiences enhanced my regard for Rajkumar Shukla if they also enabled me to know him better. I saw now that Rajkumar Shukla could not guide me and that I must take the reins in my own hands. Chapter 137 The Gentle Bihari I knew Maulana Masarol Hak in London when he was studying for the bar and when I met him. At the Bombay Congress in 1915 the year in which he was president of the Muslim League he had renewed the acquaintance and extended me an invitation to stay with him whenever I happened to go to Patna. I bethought myself of this invitation and sent him a note indicating the purpose of my visit. He immediately came in his car and pressed me to accept his hospitality. I thanked him and requested him to guide me to my destination by the first available train, the railway guide being useless to an utter stranger like me. He had a talk with Rajkumar Shukla and suggested that I should first go to Muzaffarpur. There was a train for that place the same evening, and he sent me off by it. Principal Kripalani was then in Muzaffarpur. I had known of him ever since my visit to Hyderabad. Dr. Koithram had told me of his great sacrifice, of his simple life and of the ashram that Dr. Koithram was running out of funds provided by Professor Kripalani. He used to be a professor in the government college, Muzaffarpur, and had just resigned the post when I went there. I had sent a telegram informing him of my arrival and he met me at the station with a crowd of students. Though the train reached there at midnight, he had no rooms of his own and was staying with Professor Malkani who therefore virtually became my host. It was an extraordinary thing in those days for a government professor to harbor a man like me. Professor Kripalani spoke to me about the desperate condition of Bihar, particularly of the Tir Hut division and gave me an idea of the difficulty of my task. He had established very close contact with the Biharis and had already spoken to them about the mission that took me to Bihar. In the morning a small group of vakils called on me. I still remember Ramnavmi Prasad among them as his earnestness specially appealed to me. It is not possible, he said, for you to do the kind of work you have come for if you stay here. Meaning Professor Malkani's quarters. You must come and stay with one of us. Gaya Babu is a well-known vakil here. I have come on his behalf and invite you to stay with him. I confess we are all afraid of government but we shall render what help we can. Most of the things Rajkumar Shukla has told you are true. It is a pity our leaders are not here today. I have however wired to them. Both Bapa Brajkishor Prasad and Babu Rajendra Prasad. I expect them to arrive shortly and they are sure to be able to give you all the information you want and to help you considerably. Pray come over to Gaya Babu's place. This was a request that I could not resist, though I hesitated for fear of embarrassing Gaya Babu. But he put me at ease and so I went over to stay with him. He and his people showered all their affection on me. Rajkishorebabu now arrived from Darbanga and Rajendra Babu from Puri. Rajkishorebabu was not the Babu Brajkishore Prasad I had met in Lucknow. 
He impressed me this time with his humility, simplicity, goodness and extraordinary faith, so characteristic of the Biharis and my heart was joyous over it. The Bihar Vakil's regard for him was an agreeable surprise to me. Soon I felt myself becoming bound to this circle of friends and lifelong friendship. Rajkisharebabu acquainted me with the facts of the case. He used to be in the habit of taking up the cases of the poor tenants. There were two such cases pending when I went there. When he won any such case, he consoled himself that he did not charge fees from these simple peasants. Lawyers labor under the belief that if they do not charge fees, they will have no wherewithal to run their households and will not be able to render effective help to the poor people. The figures of the fees they charged and the standard of a barrister's fees in Bengal and Bihar staggered me. We gave 10,000 rupees to so and so for his opinion, I was told. Nothing less than four figures in any case. The friends listened to my kindly reproach and did not misunderstand me. Having studied these cases, said I, I have come to the conclusion that we should stop going to law courts. Taking such cases to the courts does little good. Where the riots are so crushed and fear-stricken, law courts are useless. The real relief for them is to be free from fear. We cannot sit still until we have driven hashtag Tinkathia hashtag out of Bihar. I had thought that I should be able to leave here in two days, but I now realize that the work might take even two years. I am prepared to give that time if necessary. I am now feeling my ground, but I want your help. I found Brajkisharebabu exceptionally cool-headed. We shall render all the help we can, he said. Quietly, but pray tell us what kind of help you will need. And thus we sat talking until midnight. I shall have little use for your legal knowledge, I said to them. I want clerical assistance and help. In interpretation. It may be necessary to face imprisonment, but much so far as you feel. Yourselves capable of going. Even turning yourselves into clerks and giving up your profession for. An indefinite period is no small thing. I find it difficult to understand the local dialect of Hindi and I shall not be able to read papers written in Kaiti or Urdu. I shall want you to translate them for me. We cannot afford to pay for this work. It should all be done for love and out of a spirit of service. Rajka Sharebabu understood this immediately and he now cross-examined me and his companions by turns. He tried to ascertain the implications of all that I had said how long there service would be required, how many of them would be needed, whether they might serve by turns and so on. Then he asked the vakils the capacity of their sacrifice. Ultimately they gave me this assurance. Such and such a number of us will do whatever you may ask. Some of us will be with you for so much time as you may require. The idea of accommodating oneself to imprisonment is a novel thing for us. We will try to assimilate it. Chapter 138 Face to face with Ahimsa My object was to inquire into the condition of the Shamparan agriculturists and understand their grievances against the indigo planters. For this purpose it was necessary that I should meet thousands of the riots. But I deemed it essential, before starting on my inquiry, to know the planters' side of the case and see the commissioner of the division. I sought and was granted appointments with both. The secretary of the Planters Association told me plainly that I was an outsider and that I had no business to come between the planters and their tenants, but if I had any representation to make, I might submit it in writing. I politely told him that I did not regard myself as an outsider and that I had every right to inquire into the condition of the tenants if they desired me to do so. The acquainted my co-workers with all this and told them that there was a likelihood of government stopping me from proceeding further and that I might have to go to jail earlier than I had expected and that if I was to be arrested it would be best that the arrest should take place in Modihari or if possible in Betia. It was advisable, therefore, that I should go to those places early as possible. Champaran is a district of the Tirhut division and Modihari is its headquarters. 
Rajkumar Shuklas. Place was in the vicinity of Betia and the tenants belonging to the hashtag Kothis hashtag in its neighborhood. Were the poorest in the district. Rajkumar Shukla wanted me to see them and I was equally anxious to do so. So I started with my co-workers from Modihari the same day. Babu Gorak Prasad harbored us in. His home which became a caravanserai. It could hardly contain us all. The very same day we heard that about five miles from Modihari a tenant had been ill-treated. It was decided that in company with Babu Dharnidhar Prasad, I should go and see him the next morning and we accordingly set off for the place on elephant's back. An elephant, by the way, is about as common in Champaran as a bullock cart in Gujarat. We had scarcely gone half when a messenger from the police superintendent overtook us and said that the latter had sent his compliments. I saw what he meant. Having left Duranid Harbabu to proceed to the original destination, I got into the hired carriage which the messenger had brought. He then served on me a notice to leave Champaran and drove me to my place. On his asking me to acknowledge the service of the notice, I wrote to the effect that I did not propose to comply with it and leave Champaran till my inquiry was finished. Thereupon I received a summons to take my trial the next day for disobeying the order to leave Champaran. I kept awake that whole night writing letters and giving necessary instructions to Babu Brachkishore. Prasad. The news of the notice and the summons spread like wildfire and I was told that Modihari that day witnessed unprecedented scenes. Garakbabu's house and the courthouse overflowed with men. Fortunately I had finished all my work during the night and so was able to cope with the crows. My companions proved the greatest help. They occupied themselves with regulating the crowds for the latter followed me wherever I went. A sort of friendliness sprang up between the officials collector, magistrate, police superintendent and myself. I might have legally resisted the notices served on me. Instead I accepted them all and my conduct towards the officials was correct. They thus saw that I did not want to offend them personally, but that I wanted to offer civil resistance to their orders. In this way they were put at ease and instead of harassing me they gladly availed themselves of my and my co-workers cooperation in regulating the crowds. But it was an ocular demonstration to them of the fact that their authority was shaken. The people had for the moment lost all fear of punishment and yielded obedience to the power of love which their new friend exercised. It should be remembered that no one knew me in Champaran. The peasants were all ignorant. Champaran, being far up north of the Ganges and right at the foot of the Himalayas in close. Proximity to Nepal was cut off from the rest of India. The Congress was practically unknown in those parts. Even those who had heard the name of the Congress shrank from joining it or even mentioning it. And now the Congress and its members had entered this land, though not in the name of the Congress, yet in a far more real sense. In consultation with my co-workers I had decided that nothing should be done in the name of the Congress. What we wanted was work and not name, substance and not shadow. For the name of the Congress was the hashtag bet noir hashtag of the government and their controllers the planters. To them. The Congress was a byword for lawyers wrangles, evasion of law through legal loopholes, a eh? byword for bomb and anarchical crime and for diplomacy and hypocrisy. We had to disillusion them both. Therefore we had decided not to mention the name of the organization called the Congress. It was enough, we thought, if they understood and followed the spirit of the Congress. Instead of its letter. No emissaries had therefore been sent there, openly or secretly, on behalf of the Congress to prepare the ground for our arrival. Rajkumar Shukla was incapable of reaching the thousands of peasants. No political work had yet been done amongst them. The world outside Champaran was not known to them. And yet they received me as though we had been age-long friends. It is no exaggeration, but the literal truth, to say that in this meeting with the peasants I was face to face. With God, Ahimsa and Truth.
When I come to examine my title to this realization, I find nothing but my love for the people. And this in turn is nothing but an expression of my unshakable faith in Ahimsa. That day in Champaran was an unforgettable event in my life and a red letter day for the peasants and for me. According to the law, I was to be on my trial, but truly speaking government was to be on its trial. The commissioner only succeeded in trapping government in the net which he had spread for me. Chapter 139. Case withdrawn. The trial began, the government pleader, the magistrate and other officials were on. Tenderhooks. They were at a loss to know what to do. The government pleader was pressing the magistrate to postpone the case. But I interfered and requested the magistrate not to postpone the case as I wanted to plead guilty to having disobeyed the order to leave Champerin and read. A brief statement as follows. With the permission of the court I would like to make a brief statement showing why I have taken the very serious step of seemingly disobeying the order passed under section 144 of CRPC. In my humble opinion it is a question of difference of opinion between the local administration and myself. I have entered the country with motives of rendering humanitarian and national service. I have done so in response to a pressing invitation to come and help the riots. Who urge they are not being fairly treated by the indigo planters. I could not render any help without studying them. Problem. I have, therefore, come to study it with the assistance, if possible, of the administration. And the planters. I have no other motive and cannot believe that my coming can in any way disturb public peace and cause loss of life. I claim to have considerable experience in such matters. The administration, however, have thought differently. I fully appreciate their difficulty. And I admit too that they can only proceed upon information they received. As a law-abiding citizen my first instinct would be, as it was, to obey the order served upon me. But I could not do. So without doing violence to my sense of duty to those for whom I have come, I feel that I could just now serve them only by remaining in their midst. I could not, therefore, voluntarily retire. Amid this conflict of duties I could only throw the responsibility of removing me from them on the administration. I am fully conscious of the fact that a person holding in the public life of India a position such as I do has to be most careful in setting an example. It is my firm belief that in the complex constitution under which we are living, the only safe and honorable course for a self-respecting man is, in the circumstances such as face me, to do what I have decided to do, that is, to submit without protest to the penalty of disobedience. I venture to make this statement not in any way in extenuation of the penalty to be awarded against me, but to show that I have disregarded the order served upon me not for want of respect for lawful authority, but in obedience to the higher law of our being, the voice of conscience. There was now no occasion to postpone the hearing, but as both the magistrate and the government pleader had been taken by surprise, the magistrate postponed judgment. Meanwhile, I had wired full details to the viceroy, to Putna friends, as also to Pundit Madan Mohan Malviya, and others. Before I could appear before the court to receive the sentence, the magistrate sent a written message that the lieutenant governor had ordered the case against me to be withdrawn, and the collector wrote to me saying that I was at liberty to conduct the proposed inquiry, and that I might at liberty to conduct the proposed inquiry, and that I might count on whatever help I needed from the officials. None of us was prepared for this prompt and happy issue. I called on the collector Mr. Haycock. He seemed to be a good man, anxious to do justice. He told me that I might ask for whatever papers I desired to see and that I was at liberty to see him whenever I liked. The country thus had its first direct object lesson in civil disobedience. The affair was freely discussed both locally and in the press and my inquiry got unexpected publicity. It was necessary for my inquiry that the government should remain natural. But the inquiry did not need support from press reporters or leading articles in the press. Indeed the situation in 
Champerin was so delicate and difficult that over-energetic criticism or highly colored reports might damage the cause which I was seeking to espouse. So I wrote to the editors of the principal papers requesting them not to trouble to send any reporters as I should send them whatever might be necessary for publication and keep them informed. I knew that the government attitude countenancing my presence had displeased the Champerin planters and I know that even the officials, though they could say nothing openly, could hardly have liked it. Incorrect or misleading reports, therefore, were likely to incense them all the more. And their ire, instead of descending on me, would be sure to descend on the poor fear-stricken. Riots and seriously hinder my search for the truth about the case. In spite of these precautions the planters engineered against me a poisonous agitation. All sorts of falsehoods appeared in the press about my co-workers and myself. But my extreme cautiousness and my insistence on truth even to the minutest detail turned the edge of their sword. The planters left no stone unturned in maligning Brajkisharebabu but the more they maligned him the more he rose in the estimation of the people. In such a delicate situation as this I did not think it proper to invite any leaders from other provinces. Pundit Malavyaji had sent me an assurance that, whenever I wanted him, I had only to send him word, but I did not trouble him. I thus prevented the struggle from assuming a political aspect. But I sent to the leaders and the principal papers occasional reports, not for publication, but merely for their information. I had seen that, even where the end might be political, but where the cause was non-political, one damaged it by giving it a political aspect and helped it by keeping it within its non-political limit. The Champerin struggle was a proof of the fact that disinterested service of the people in any sphere ultimately helps the country politically. Chapter 140 Methods of Work To give a full account of the Champerin inquiry would be to narrate the history for the period of the Champerin riot which is out of the question in these chapters. The Champerin inquiry was a bold experiment with truth and ahimsa and I am giving week by week only what occurs to me is worth giving from that point of view. For more details the reader must turn to SJT Rajendra. Prasad's history of the Champerin Satyagraha in Hindi of which I am told an English edition is now in the press. But to return to the subject matter of this chapter. The inquiry could not be conducted in Garakbabu's house without practically asking poor Garakbabu to vacate it. And the people of Modihari had not yet shed their fear to the extent of renting a house to us. However, Rajkisharebabu tactfully secured one with considerable open space about it and we now removed there. It was not quite possible to carry on the work without money. It had not been the practice hitherto. To appeal to the public for money for work of this kind, Rajkisharebabu and his friends were mainly vakils who either contributed funds themselves or found it from friends whenever there was an occasion. How could they ask the people to pay when they and their kind could well afford to do so? That seemed to be the argument. I had made up my mind not to accept anything from the Champerin riots. It would be bound to be misinterpreted. I was equally determined not to appeal to the country at large for funds to conduct this inquiry. For that was likely to give it an all India and political aspect. Friends from Bombay offered 15,000 rupees, but I declined the offer with. Thanks. I decided to get as much as was possible with Brajkisharebabu's help from well to do. Bihari's living outside Champaran and, if more was needed, to approach my friend Dr. PJ Mehta of Rangoon. Dr. Mehta readily agreed to send me whatever might be needed. We were thus free. From all anxiety on this score, we were not likely to require large funds as we were bent on. Exercising the greatest economy in consonance with the poverty of need any large amount. I have an impression that we expended in all not more than 3,000 rupees and as far as I Remember, we saved a few hundred rupees from what we had collected. The curious ways of living of my companions in the early days were a constant theme of raillery. At their expense, 
Each of the vakils had a servant and a cook and therefore a separate kitchen. And they often had their dinner as late as midnight. Though they paid their own expenses there. Irregularity worried me, but as we had become close friends there was no possibility of a misunderstanding between us and they received my ridicule in good part. Ultimately it was agreed that the servants should be dispensed with, that all the kitchens should be amalgamated, and that regular hours should be observed. As all were not vegetarians and as two kitchens would have been expensive, a common vegetarian kitchen was decided upon. It was also felt necessary to insist on simple meals. These arrangements considerably reduced the expenses and saved us a lot of time and energy. And both these were badly needed. Crowds of peasants came to make their statements and they were followed by an army of companions who filled the compound and garden to overflowing. The efforts of my companions to save me from hashtag darshan hashtag seekers were often of no avail and I had to be exhibited for hashtag darshan hashtag at particular hours. At least five to seven volunteers were required to take down statements and even then some people had to go away in the evening without being able to make their statements. All these statements were not essential, many of them being repetitions, but the people could not be satisfied otherwise and I appreciated their feeling in the matter. Those who took down the statements had to observe certain rules. Each peasant had to be closely cross-examined and whoever failed to satisfy the test was rejected. This entailed a lot of extra time but most of the statements were thus rendered incontrovertible. An officer from the CID would always be present when these statements were recorded. We might have prevented him, but we had decided from the very beginning not only not to mind the presence of CID officers, but to treat them with courtesy and to give them all the information that it was possible to give them. This was far from doing us any harm. On the contrary the very fact that the statements were taken down in the presence of the CID officers made the peasants more fearless. Whilst on the one hand excessive fear of the CID was driven out of the peasants' minds, on the other, their presence exercised a natural restraint on exaggeration. It was the business of CID friends to entrap people and so the peasants had necessarily to be cautious. As I did not want to irritate the planters, but to win them over by gentleness, I made a point of writing to and meeting such of them against whom allegations of a serious nature were made. I met the planters' association as well, placed the riot's grievances before them and acquainted myself with their point of view. Some of the planters hated me, some were indifferent and a few treated me with courtesy. Chapter 141 Companions Rajkisharebabu and Rajendrababu were a matchless pair. Their devotion made it impossible for me to take a single step without their help, their disciples or their companions. Shambhababu, Anyagrababu, Duranababu, Ramnavmibabu and other vakils were always with us. Vindhyababu and Janakharababu also came and helped us now and then. All these were Biharis. Their principal work was to take down the riot statements. Professor Kripalani could not but cast in his lot with us. Though a Sindhi he was more Bihari than a born Bihari. I have seen only a few workers capable of merging themselves in the province of their adoption. Kripalani is one of those few. He made it impossible for anyone to feel that he belonged to a different province. He was my gatekeeper in chief. For the time being he made it the end and aim of his life to save me from darshan seekers. He warded off people calling to his aid. Now his unfailing humor, now his non-violent threats. At nightfall he would take up his occupation of a teacher and regale his companions with his historical studies and observations, and quicken any timid visitor into bravery. Maulana Masarol Hack had registered his name on the standing list of helpers whom I might count upon whenever necessary, and he made a point of looking in once or twice a month. The pomp and splendor in which he then lived was in sharp contrast to his simple life of today. The 
way in which he associated with us made us feel that he was one of us, though his fashionable. Habit gave a stranger a different impression. As I gained more experience of Bihar, I became convinced that work of a permanent nature was impossible without proper village education. The riot's ignorance was pathetic. They either allowed their children to roam about or made them toil on indigo plantations from morning to night for a couple of coppers a day. In those days a male laborer's wage did not exceed ten. P.S. A female's did not exceed six and a child's three. He who succeeded in earning four annas. A day was considered most fortunate. In consultation with my companions I decided to open primary schools in six villages. One of our conditions with the villagers was that they should provide the teachers with board and lodging. While we would see to the other expenses, the village folk had hardly any cash in their hands but they could well afford to provide foodstuffs. Indeed they had already expressed their readiness to contribute grain and other raw materials. From where to get the teachers was a great problem. It was difficult to find local teachers who would work for a bare allowance or without remuneration. My idea was never to entrust children to commonplace teachers. Their literary qualification was not so essential as their moral fiber. So I issued a public appeal for voluntary teachers. It received a ready response. SJT. Gangad Hareo Deshpande sent Baba Saheb Soman and Pundalik Srimathi Avantika by Gokhale. Came from Bombay and Mrs. Ananda by Vaishampayan from Pune. I sent to the ashram for Kotalal, Surendranath, and my son Devdas. About this time, Mahadev Desai and Narahari. Parikh with their wives cast in their lot with me. Kastrabai was also summoned for the work. This was a fairly strong contingent. Srimathi Avantikabai and Srimathi Anandabai were educated. Enough, but Srimathi Durga Desai and Srimathi Manaben Parikh had nothing more than a bare knowledge of Gujarati and Kastrabai not even that. How were these ladies to instruct the children? In Hindi? I explained to them they were expected to teach the children not grammar and the three R's so much as cleanliness and good manners. I further explained that even as regards letters there was not so great a difference between Gujarati, Hindi and Marathi as they imagined and in the primary classes at any rate the teaching of the rudiments of the alphabet and numerals was not a difficult matter. The result was that the classes taken by these ladies were found to be most successful. The experience inspired them with confidence and interest in their work. Avantika Bais became a model school. She threw herself heart and soul into her work. She brought her exceptional gifts to bear on it. Through these ladies we could, to some extent, reach the village. Women. But I did not want to stop at providing for primary education. The villages were insanitary, the Lanes full of filth, the wells surrounded by mud and stink and the courtyards unbearably untidy. The elder people badly needed education in cleanliness. They were all suffering from various skin diseases. They were all suffering from sanitary work as possible and to penetrate every department of their lives. Doctors were needed for this work. I requested the servants of India Society to lend us the services of the late Dr. Dev. We had been great friends and he readily offered his services for six months. The teachers men and women had all to work under him. All of them had express instructions not to concern themselves with grievances against planters or with politics. People who had any complaints to make were to be referred to me. No one was to venture out of his beat. The friends carried out these instructions with wonderful fidelity. Ido not remember a single occasion of indiscipline. Chapter 142. Penetrating the Villages. As far as was possible we placed each school in charge of one man and one woman. These volunteers had to look after medical relief and sanitation. The women folk had to be approached. Through women. Medical relief was a very simple affair. Castor oil, quinine and sulfur ointment were the only 
drugs provided to the volunteers. If the patient showed a furred tongue or complained of constipation, castor oil was administered in case of fever quinine was given after an opening. Dose of castor oil and the sulfur ointment was applied in case of boils and itch after thoroughly. Washing the affected parts. No patient was permitted to take home any medicine. Wherever there was some complication Dr. Dev used to visit each center on certain fixed days in the week. Quite a number of people availed themselves of this simple relief. This plan of work will not seem strange when it is remembered that the prevailing ailments were few and amenable to simple treatment by no means requiring expert help. As for the people the arrangement answered. Excellently. Sanitation was a difficult affair. The people were not prepared to do anything themselves. Even the field laborers were not ready to do their own scavenging. But Dr. Dev was not a man easily to lose heart. He and the volunteers concentrated their energies on making a village ideally clean. They swept the roads and the courtyards, cleaned out the wells, filled up the pools nearby and lovingly persuaded the villagers to raise volunteers from among us themselves. In some villages, they shamed people into taking up the work and in others the people were so enthusiastic that they even prepared roads to enable my car to go from place to place. These sweet experiences were not unmixed with bitter ones of people's apathy. I remember some villagers frankly expressing their dislike for this work. It may not be out of place here to narrate an experience that I have described before now at many meetings. Bidaharva was a small village in which was one of our schools. I happened to visit a smaller village in its vicinity and found some of the women dressed very dirtily. So I told my wife to ask them why they did not wash their clothes. She spoke to them. One of the women took her into her hut and said, look now, there is no box or cupboard here containing other clothes. The hashtag sorry hashtag I am wearing is the only one I have. How am I to wash it? Tell Mahatmaji to get me. Another hashtag sorry hashtag and I shall then promise to bathe and put on clean clothes every day. This cottage was not an exception but a type to be found in many Indian villages. In countless cottages in India people live without any furniture and without a change of clothes merely with a rag to cover their shame. One more experience I will note. In Champaran there is no lack of bamboo and grass. The school hut they had put up at Bidaharva was made of these materials. Someone possibly some of the Neighboring planters men set fire to it one night. It was not thought advisable to build another hut of bamboo and grass. The school was in charge of SJT Soman and Casterby. SJT Soman decided to build a hashtag pukka hashtag house and thanks to his infectious labor many cooperated with him and a brick house was soon made ready. There was no fear now of this building being burnt down. Thus the volunteers with their schools, sanitation work and medical relief gained the confidence and respect of the village folk and were able to bring good influence to bear upon them. But I must confess with regret that my hope of putting this constructive work on a permanent footing was not fulfilled. The volunteers had come for temporary periods, I could not secure any. More from outside and permanent honorary workers from Bihar were not available. As soon as my work in Champaran was finished, work outside, which had been preparing in the meantime, drew me away. The few months' work in Champaran, however, took such deep root that its influence in one form or another is to be observed there even today. Chapter 143 When a governor is good, whilst on the one hand social service work of the kind I have described in the foregoing, Chapters was being carried out, on the other the work of recording statements of the riots. Grievances was progressing apace. Thousands of such statements were taken and they could not but have their effect. The ever-growing number of riots coming to make their statements increased the planters' wrath and they moved heaven and earth to counteract my inquiry. One day I received a letter from the Bihar government to the following effect, your inquiry had been sufficiently prolonged, should you not now bring it to an end and leave Bihar? 
the letter was couched in polite language but its meaning was obvious. I wrote in reply that the inquiry was bound to be prolonged and unless and until it resulted in bringing relief to the people I had no intention of leaving Bihar, I pointed out that it was open to government to terminate my inquiry by accepting the riots grievances as genuine and redressing them or by recognizing that the riots had made out a hashtag prima facie hashtag case for an ethical inquiry which should be immediately instituted. Sir Edward Gate, the lieutenant governor, asked me to see him, expressed his willingness to appoint an inquiry and invited me to be a member of the committee. I ascertained the names of the other members and after consultation with my co-workers agreed to serve on the committee on condition that I should be free to confer with my co-workers during the progress of the inquiry. That government should recognize that, by being a member of the committee, I did not cease to be the riot's advocate and that in case the result of the inquiry failed to give me satisfaction, I should be free to guide and advise the riots as to what line of action they should take. Sir Edward Gate accepted the condition as just and proper and announced the inquiry. The late Sir Frank Sly was appointed chairman of the comedy. The committee found in favor of the riots and recommended that the planters should refund a portion of the exactions made by them which the committee had found to be unlawful and that the hashtag Tinkathia hashtag system should be abolished by law. Sir Edward Gate had a large share in getting the committee to make unanimous report and in getting the Agrarain bill passed in accordance with the committee's recommendations. Had he not adopted a firm attitude, and had he not brought all his tact to bear on the subject, the report would not have been unanimous and the Agrarian Act would not have been passed. The planters wielded extraordinary power. They offered strenuous opposition to the bill in spite of the report, but Sir Edwin Gate remained firm up to the last and fully carried out the recommendations of the committee. The hashtag Tinkathia hashtag system which had been in existence for about a century was thus abolished and with it the planters hashtag Raj hashtag came to an end. The riots who had all along remained crushed now. Somewhat came to their own and the superstition that the stain of indigo could never be washed out was exploded. It was my desire to continue the constructive work for some years to establish more schools and to penetrate the villages more effectively. The ground had been prepared, but it did not please God, as often before, to allow my plans to be fulfilled. Fate decided otherwise and drove me to take up work elsewhere.